Hey, hey, welcome back. It's hour two of a terrific Tuesday edition of Liquid Lunch on Newsmax TV. I'm John Tobacco. We're coming to you today as we do every day, Monday to Friday, noon to two Eastern from the uh, Newsmax headquarters right here in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, before uh, kicking off this hour two with the powerhouse of a leadoff guest, that's uh, Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis. He's a uh, senior fellow at Defense Priorities. He's a, uh, served 21 years with our uh, U.S. Army, leading uh, fighting forces into uh, four combat deployments, including two in Afghanistan. Uh, Colonel Davis, uh, thank you again for joining us today on Liquid Lunch. Always glad to be here. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to have you, and as always, thank you for uh, all of your great commitment to our country and fighting for freedom and liberty. Uh, it seems like we're under attack uh, by the enemies of America, and they're taking aim at the uh, Saudis, who uh, I guess are buying a whole bunch of you know defense equipment, and they seem to be, for the most part, our ally there. Um, Colonel, I want you to take a look at what Democratic presidential candidate uh, Tulsi Gabbard had to say and get your thoughts on what's happening with Iran. There's nothing in our Constitution that gives you the power to go to war without the express consent of Congress. What to speak of giving you the power to offer our military to a foreign power like the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to use as they wish. President Trump, your words and actions are a betrayal of my brothers and sisters in uniform, the American people, and our Constitution. My fellow service members and I, we are not your prostitutes. You are not our pimp. Wow. Ooh. That was uh, pretty harsh. Um, I don't, I personally didn't take the president as saying, like, our army is a bunch of mercenaries. I kind of took it as him saying, if we have to help the Saudis, um, they should compensate us for it. Well, I, I think that, you know, she's in a presidential campaign and she's looking for things that are going to get her on, you know, TV. And certainly she succeeded with that. Uh, she does, to an extent, have a, have a point. Though she certainly went, a little, I think, too far with it in the, in the way she phrased it. But the fact is, this was at the core an issue between Saudi Arabia and Iran. I mean, this actually goes back centuries with the Sunni Shia split and, and certainly an extension of the proxy war going on between those two in Yemen. And this is the predictable result of Saudi Arabia being unwilling to resolve this war and going on for now four plus years. And the bottom line is our armed forces exist to defend our country and our interests. And our interests have not been put at risk. And our interests, we were not attacked. And if anyone's going to respond, it's going to be Saudi Arabia, not the United States. Well, uh, Colonel, just to back things up a bit, uh, I know we have a tweet from uh, the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, and we could put that up on the screen when you can. Uh, so Mike Pompeo is claiming in this tweet here that um, Iran is definitely responsible. Now, Iran is saying they're not responsible. They're not not only not taking credit, but they're denying it flatly. The Houthis in Yemen, who are an Iranian backed rebel group in Yemen, they're claiming responsibility and they say they carried out this attack on Saudi Arabia. At this point, in spite of what Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has said, because after the Iraq war, weapons of mass destruction, slam dunk debacle, many of us uh, think twice about blindly accepting what government officials say uh, is the case. Do we know for sure if Iran was responsible for this attack on Saudi Arabia? No, there's really no way you can. I mean, you can say that it's likely that it was Iran. You could even say that even if it was the Houthis, that they probably got a lot of Iranian support and backing because they are being backed by them openly. But I mean, even the, the French foreign minister that earlier today said they don't have any evidence to show conclusively who it was. You have to do a lot of uh, forensic analysis on the ground that takes a long time to be able to prove that. So I would be in the camp that let's wait and see what the evidence shows. But really, no matter what the evidence ends up showing, this is still not an issue for the American military to get involved with. Well, look, I, I certainly agree with you, and I am uh, no fan of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Not only are they a dictatorship, but they're a theocracy where there are no human rights. They still execute people for sorcery. And you can understand why some of the Houthis are somewhat upset 
upset that thousands of Yemeni civilians have been blown up by the Saudis with bombs that say made in the USA on them. However, uh, what we're seeing in our global energy markets is very real. We've seen the price of oil just skyrocket. Let's say it's the Iranians that did carry this out. Should we just sit idly by and let them dramatically rise, raise the price of oil because they're at a Cold War which might be heating up with Saudi Arabia? Well, see, this this goes back to the consequence of continuing to carry on this war. You keep fighting something that can't be won because this military, this fight can't be won militarily. These are the kinds of consequences. If anything, we should be putting pressure on both of them to the extent that we can to resolve this matter and get the war uh, resolved and off the table. Because no matter what anybody would like to have happen, certainly we would prefer that the temperature go down and the risk of war be eliminated. But using force on our end will only skyrocket that. And look, we have to be clear, Iran has been unambiguous and repeatedly open about saying if they're attacked, they're not going to just sit by and take it passively. They're going to go into an all-out war. And whether they mean it or not, we can't take the risk that they will make good on their threats to shoot American warships in the Gulf, American air, manned aircraft, American bases in, in Qatar, in Syria, in Iraq. We can't take that risk, and we don't need to have our soldiers attacked and killed for something that's not even in our national interest. So you are going on record and saying Lindsey Graham and folks like that are wrong when they call for a retaliatory American military strike on Iran here. I am unequivocally opposed to that. Without any question, it's not our, our interest. Our armed forces exist to defend us when we're attacked or an imminent attack against us. It's not to be used for the Saudi Arabia, almost like a Saudi defense force. And we're not that. And this is Saudi's making. Saudi Arabia has to fix it. Yeah. Uh, Colonel, uh, when when the, the economic interests of the U.S. are attacked because oil is flying up, I saw uh, General McCaffrey uh, on one of the other networks last night saying that without committing fighting troops, uh, there are many things we can do militarily to, to Iran, um, like attack, uh, like uh, drone strikes on their um, oil refineries and, and, and some of, of their key military installments. Uh, is some kind of strike like that? Uh, just to just to keep the Iranians in line is 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 that even make any sense to you? No, it doesn't because it's not going to keep Iran in line. If anything, it's going to cause them to be more provocative and take more actions, which would certainly make the price of oil go up even higher. So that's not going to solve anything. And this really highlights the limits of military power. And there's too many in the United States, Senator Graham being one of them, that likes to go to military force not as a last resort, but as a policy option of first choice. And it just has limitations. We need to put a lot more emphasis on diplomacy and lowering the temperature of potential conflict, not just using it right off the bat. And uh, my final question, Colonel, is let me ask you about our other problem, child, Afghanistan. Uh, we saw, unfortunately, the death of another American serviceman, I believe a Green Beret, uh, passing away or murdered in Afghanistan. This is the 17th American killed in Afghanistan this year. That's more than we've seen in any year since 2014. What are we still doing in Afghanistan? The president doesn't want to be there. It doesn't seem like the Afghan government wants us there terribly much. And the Taliban doesn't want us there. Nobody wants to be there. Why are Americans still being killed? Well, th this is one of the big problems, which why I was so disappointed at how the last you know, negotiations ended where we said since we couldn't make a deal with the Taliban that all the discussions were off. But as I'm strongly advocating, we don't need to deal with the Taliban. We need to just say for the benefit of our country and for the soldiers that are still there, we don't need to lose another soldier on a fight that doesn't even affect our national security. And, man, we can't get out of there fast enough. And it's just it's just brutal, brutal to me to think about my brothers in uniform who were sacrificing their lives and it's not even helping the country that needs to stop i think um one of the to me one of the more calming things trump has said recently is that he wants to draw down the deployments in afghanistan and we had a uh, purple heart recipient sean parnell on the show a couple weeks ago and his suggestion was to go down to about eight thousand and just have intelligence uh, gathering folks out there um Maybe Trump is just, you know, banging the drum with Saudi Arabia because by actions, it looks like he's trying to get us out of Afghanistan finally. 
Yeah, and, and let's hope that he makes good on that. That's one of the reasons why I advocate uh, Doug McGregor to be the next national security advisor, because probably better than anyone that's even been listed mentioned for that job. He understands the, the limitations of combat power, and he understands the power that it can be used for to, to keep our interests safe. And, and he would definitely get us out of there, or he would show the president a good way to get us out of there that would accomplish his objectives as the political objectives. But that is something that needs to happen. I don't think you can even leave 8,000 troops there, because I don't think the Taliban would think that's a good situation. And that doesn't help us. I, I'd like to reiterate that. Having 8,000 troops there won't keep us any safer here than what we are with no troops on the ground there because we keep ourselves safe other ways got it thank you very much colonel daniel davis just so you know uh frank and i have been uh lobbying the president um for you to also be in that discussion to replace john bolton and uh if not you're always welcome here on liquid lunch thank you so much colonel thank you appreciate and, it uh thank you for watching liquid lunch don't go anywhere we'll take a quick break and be back after this